Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, staying for another session this afternoon. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Teresa Chian, and I am one of the uh, executive, I guess, team for the chief, uh, sorry, for the faculty incubator program, um, That, and I'm the chief academic officer um, for that. Um, we're going to give you some insights into innovations in faculty development by giving you a lens into and a look into the Alien Faculty Incubator Program from the eyes of both teachers and um, some of our participants from last year. Um, myself and uh, Mike Gottlieb have received an honorary for our teaching and administrative coordination of the Alien Faculty Incubator. Thought it would be important to be above board for that. And um, we're going to introduce it. I'm going to introduce you to the man sitting next to me who has been one of the IMED Ed chairs, but he's also my friend and colleague from the Alien Faculty Incubator, and he is someone who has been um, definitely very much involved in helping us develop this uh, pilot project. Thank you. I'm Bob Cooney, the incoming program director at Geisinger Medical Center. And so about uh, a year and a half ago, I get this message from Teresa and said, hey, we want to get you back involved with Allium, and we have this really cool idea, and it's a faculty incubator. As my program director said when I graduated, I've never said no to a cool project. And the same thing applied here. And so they invited me into their fold on a project that they had already kind of perfected through some of their other work with the chief resident incubator. And essentially what they did was took a group of core mentors and then a group of junior faculty and put them together online and said, let's see how we can educate them. And then they reached outside of the community and found a number of really stellar mentors from the ACGME, from the Journal of Academic Medicine in Canada, and then <laughs> brought us all together to kind of be core mentors and then guest mentors. And what we're going to do next is turn the lens onto our learners and see their reflections of their year-long experience and how this really, we think, kind of upsets the apple cart when it comes to the future of faculty development. All right, so we are proud to present to you lessons learned from the faculty incubator, participants and facts. All right, so first up, we have four, well, so we have four speakers, and then we also have um, Megan, who is one of our faculty members that she's gonna share some of her secrets as well. But four of our speakers are Sarah, Mike, Andrew, and Antonia. So we're gonna have Sarah take it away. All right, All right you guys. I'm Sarah Krasaniak. Uh, I apologize for my voice. Alium has created this horrible situation where I have now like have all these people to network with here at Cord, and um, I've over networked and I've lost my voice. So, <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to talk about is peer review. I think this is a really important topic that. Um, as junior faculty members, this is a really critical part to our development and success in academic medicine, but it's really not an area that we get a lot of training on. Um, definitely in residency, you know, I really didn't learn much about what actually peer review involves from both ends um, as an author and then also as a reviewer. But then all of a sudden, as a faculty member, I am expected to be a peer reviewer and know how to incorporate peer review into my writing. And really, there's not a lot of formal education around that. So we spent a whole month. Um, so we spent a whole month looking at peer review. And again, the, the two parts where this really matters, right, is not only as the author. So when you get the peer review, understanding where this is coming from. Um, how they do their process to look at your work and how you should respond to it, but then also how do you become a peer reviewer uh, to take an active role in the process and then also in turn make you a better researcher and writer. So we had a month-long peer, uh, peer review module. There are several different components to this and these screenshots are just kind of highlights of what we did. Um, there were two Google Hangouts, uh, which I know for those of you that were here the last block, we talked about uh, Google Hangouts as being a great method for um, creating kind of conversation, um, interactive conversation that can then be archived and watched later. We had two Google Hangouts, one with Mike Callahan and um, Ellen Weber, uh, talking about their experience as editors of uh, major journals, and then also Lainey Yaris and John Ilgen, as well, talking about medical education and peer review from their perspectives. Um, so some of the lessons I learned actually that I'm going to talk about I took from these Google Hangouts. 
we had a pretty extensive list of journal articles that you can see there in the middle. Um, that's just a sampling of some of the articles that we looked at in terms of what is the evidence behind peer review, what are the commentary, uh, what is the commentary that is out there around this topic. And then finally, as part of our Slack discussions, we talked about it as a group. Uh, you can see at the top there, this is our dangerous questions channel, um, which are kind of those provocative questions that we would ask each other and the mentors would give to us to, to ponder about peer review. So you can see Felix Engel there kind of talking about his process, like he reviews things backwards. And then we talk about that and discuss kind of how, how should one do peer review. So my first lesson um, is pretty simple, and this is basically get involved, right? So nothing happens without you getting involved. Um, and really, the, the three main components of this are, first of all, you just have to volunteer to review. Um, the calls go out for reviewers all of the time, um, and mentors and coworkers uh, around you can also help you find these opportunities. But the first is just volunteer. And then most importantly after that is be reliable and be consistent. So you don't want to be the reviewer that declines every paper or can't get them turned in on time. So once you take this step and volunteer to get involved, you have to be reliable and consistent. And then really as you become more involved and you do more reviews um, and you prove yourself to be a good reviewer and reliable, then eventually you can work your way up to being part of the editorial board and being a part of the process for the whole journal. So my second lesson is be methodical. Most journals have worksheets that they want you to use, um, and these are very important. Um, again, there's guidance out there, so you don't have to um, know what you're doing initially to start with. Um, you can use these worksheets to really go over um, what you should be doing, and then re review the other reviews. Um, ask to see what the other reviewers are saying, and then compare it to what you're doing. Did you miss something really big? Or were you online or did you reject it outright and two other people said, this is great, we have to accept it and then figure out where you need to improve your review to become more in line. And it's fine to have dis disagreements, but really you wanna be in line with your other reviewers. Then my third lesson is seek mentorship. Um, this was a great opportunity for me and the faculty incubator, uh, Teresa Chan, um, gave me an opportunity to be a peer reviewer and then was able to look at my review before it went live and gave me some feedback on it, which was really helpful. Um, but seek mentorship. Uh, even um, I've now taken a couple different peer review opportunities and I've asked the editors of the section I'm reviewing to give me feedback on my review um, because I think that's a really important part. Again, you can look at the other reviews, but it's helpful to get the feedback from those people on what you're doing right or where you can improve. So finally, look at the opportunities. So there's both traditional, which we are all very familiar with, um, the journals that are out there. Uh, you can volunteer to get involved with these journals as a peer reviewer. But now there are also online opportunities to become a peer reviewer for online scholarship. Um, this is one example here. This was the ICE blog at the Faculty Incubators. We put out the Educational Theory Made Practical series, but this is an online peer reviewed uh, series of um, kind of chapters on educational theory. And this is a peer review process as well. So there's various ways to get involved. Just look for them and uh, follow those three steps. Oh, thanks. All right, everyone. I'm Andy King. I'm a APD at Ohio State. And um, a little bit different than Sarah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, you know, what I learned about learning communities and, um, you know, kind of how that sort of played into the um, faculty incubator program as a whole. So what is a community of practice? So it was originally, this is a term that was originally defined by Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger back in 1998. And, you know, it was originally defined as a, as a group of people, um, usually, you know, in the same room. Back in 1998, the internet hasn't ex exploded like it has now. And what is it? It's a group of people with common interests, a group of people with a common goal of improving a specific field or interest, such as medical education in our, interest, in, a, in our particular case, and a group of people who share experiences. So it's similar to like a guild in old times. So when you had a master and you had an apprentice that would learn from the master. So similarly, communities of practice involve members with different levels of mastery. So you have novice members who participate and learn from experts through a principle known as legitimate peripheral participation. So what is legitimate peripheral participation or LPP as I am also losing my voice, so I'm gonna call it LPP. 
Um, it describes the process by which newcomers become experienced members and eventually experts within a community of practice. And how do they do that? So traditionally looking at this diagram is through engagement, interaction, collaboration, as well as learning all of the knowledge and skills that can be passed on from the expert members. So traditionally, as I mentioned, a community of practice is you know, originally defined as a group of people limited to a room. So what's unique about our community of practice? It's entirely virtual. So I have a picture of a globe here. So not only do we have members from um, United States, um, we have mentors from Canada, um, but we had a participant from Chile. And this year we also have a participant um, from India. Um, so it's truly a, a worldwide network um, of folks. And how do we keep in contact? Obviously we can't be in the same room um, as we're all over the world. So we kept in contact with Google Hangouts, which we learned about in the previous session, as well as Slack. And Slack is really the predominant um, mode of communication used in this program. You can download articles. We can share articles with one another. Um, we can have real-time discussions through text kind of messages. So it's a very valuable um, sort of way for us to communicate as junior um, faculty with our mentors throughout the program. So what did our um, community of practice look like? So we had a group of uh, mentors that are shown above, and most of which are in this room. Um, but uh, we collaborated as facubates or participants through collaboration, interaction, mentorship, and scholarship. And these occurred through different channels, such as the Dangerous Questions channel, where we discussed um, important questions and uh, allowed the junior mentors or junior members to um, kind of answer those questions with some feedback from the mentors, whether it's um, different um, opportunities for scholarship, which I'll show here in a minute. Um, or just various interactions and networking that occurred throughout the year. So here's a couple uh, uh, examples of some of the uh, scholarship that we um, put forth through our um, program. And you know this is kind of a um, unique example of the community and legitimate peripheral participation um, occurring in real time. So we were um, we had different levels of folks, both the senior mentors and uh, the junior um, participants work together in completing these um, unique um, areas of scholarship. And then ultimately, um, throughout the year, it led to the development of junior mentors, um, many of which are up here at this table. And we're going to um, kind of be the intermediary, I guess, between the senior mentors and the new um, kind of group of facubates. Um, so that really shows how we um, use the community of practice design um, virtually, and how we incorporate the legitimate peripheral participation into our group as a whole. So that's the lessons that I learned. All right, thanks, guys. So I'm Mike Gottlieb. I'm uh, old son director at Rush, the newest residency program in Chicago, as well as the chief operating officer of Alien Back in the Incubator. Now, if you were listening kind of to Sarah and Andy talk about certain things, you know as mentorship came up as kind of a consistent benefit of this program. So there are a ton of studies talking about mentorship. There are hun literally hundreds of studies where they talk about the value of mentorship, everything from happiness to retention to productivity to even work-life balance. We all know mentorship is valuable, right? But when you think about it, how was it traditionally done? It was at your institution. Where are you trained? and you hope for the best. You got paired up with someone, or you pick someone that was in close proximity to you, and that's helpful, but maybe they don't have the same academic interests. Maybe maybe you don't connect as human beings, or maybe they don't have the skill sets to get you where you want to be. If they're not interested in the speaking circuit, and you are, they might not be the best mentor for that regard. Now, we're in the digital era, which means we have much better access to people than we did before. Whereas previously, we were tethered to our institution, we can go across the, across the you know, Midwest, we can go across the country, or we can go across the world. All those barriers start to go away. So I want to talk to you about some lessons learned on virtual mentorship because it is different than our traditional approaches. Now one similarity is the biggest hurdle to any form of mentorship is that first step, that reaching out, that overcoming the hurdle and saying, I want you to be my mentor. Thankfully, we have Michelle Lynn, who on day one basically challenged them and says, this week, I want you to cold email a mentor. 
You're going to just shoot him an email, say, I think that we have some interest in Align. I would like you to be my mentor. Every single person in the packet link there this past year had to do that. And I'm going to talk about one case, Andy <laughs> King. Mostly because he's right next to me, and I have to embarrass him <laughs> um, by keeping his picture up there for a prolonged period of time. So Andy King reached out to Mike Jasandi, who was here earlier, um, had to step away. And he sent out an email saying, I'm interested in being your I'm interested in you being my mentor. And it actually matches up nicely because Andy King is a great speaker and working his way through the speaking circuit. And Mike Jasani has been a speaker for a long time. And they have a lot of shared interests with what they're looking to do within medical education. So he sent out the email and started a series of emails and conversations in this mentorship relationship that's lasted over a year. It's going to be a long-term mentorship. And it's interesting to see because they've de- he, he's been a great mentor for helping him develop. But also, you see them starting to kind of develop this reciprocality where they're speaking to each other's institutions. And opportunities are really starting to open from this. Now, speaking with a number of def- you know people who have been members of this this past year, there's not one person who regretted it. So I'd like to put that challenge out to you as well. Those, in the, those here that are in this year's faculty incubator, as well as those just sitting out there, just try that cold email approach. Find someone you think is a great mentor. Shoot me and they'll say, hey, you know, I think we have these in common. I think you would be a great mentor for me. Would you be interested in chatting for a few minutes at the next upcoming conference or a Google Hangout? Now, as much as cold emails is one approach, it's much easier to utilize existing networks. And we all have existing networks. You guys have seen, again, case in point, Sarah and Andy having half a voice is because as you walk through here in Cord, you start to recognize people you know, and more and more and more it starts to expand. Now, one of the things that was interesting about faculty incubators is you have 30 people over the course of a year plus 15 mentors over the course of this year, and it creates this great collaborative environment. Everyone's able to get to get to know each other, but as a result, now they get to know each other and their surrounding areas. So, you know, you start off in your institution, you have a circle, and you know the, a couple of people, maybe a couple of people from some other departments, but it's kind of small. And as you get to know other people, your network expands. And you can start to see how these, you get these peripheral connections you didn't previously have. But the beauty of this is it's not just these connections. It's the connections of these connections. People you didn't know or didn't have that, you have that second degree, that third degree of connection you can now get a hold of. People that you now have access to who could be great mentors. So that community creates a community outside itself and continues to expand out, which is really fun to see. Now, we oftentimes, when we envision a mentor, and I think all of us, if we close our eyes and think about a mentor, we typically think of... Amma Matu, Scott Weingart, people who are giants in the field, right? But that doesn't have to be how it is. Now, that mentors can be at any stage of the career because it depends on what they're mentoring for. When, you, when we watched you know, the Slack conversations we were, and seeing people talk back and forth, you were seeing people at the same stage of their career mentoring each other. People who are, have different experiences can mentor on different things. A prime example of this might be work-life balance. Someone who has overcome a major life stressor or someone who has just gotten over burnout, is a phenomenal mentor to someone who's currently struggling that, regardless of stage in their career. So it doesn't have to be someone that's above or, you know, by a stature. It's anyone at any given time can be a mentor for a different thing. Fourth thing, we've talked about virtual mentorship, and that's a lot of the focus. We talked about Slack today. We talked about um, a Google Hangouts and Air. We talked about different components of the virtual aspect of this, but face-to-face meetings are important. It helps to solidify that. We watched over the course of this year that the space-to-face moments really kind of helped to bring people back together, to re-solidify, to re-ground people. So we intentionally built in a few things this year, Google Hangouts on air, virtual office hours where the people can stop in and chat about different academic problems. And at every major EM conference, we had a happy hour together. And what we saw is that people would get together at these meetings, and they would re-energize that relationship because you meet with somebody, you talk to them, and you connect online. But it's different when you see them in person, when you put that face to that. It re-energizes, re-strengthens that relationship. And when this is all, when the, you know, the year ends of the course, people as they're in conferences recognize each other a lot better and you can continue those relationships a lot nicer. And the last thing is, not ju- a lot of times we talk about a mentor. I like the term virtual board of directors, which someone much wiser than I had come up with. But basically, it's a set of different mentors who, do, who help you with different <coughs> problems. Rather than having one mentor who's just the one thing, have different mentors who can do different things. For example, someone who is a great research mentor might not be the best at work-life balance. Those who are great at bedside teaching might not be so great at 
PowerPoints or, or professional te or um, lecturing, but it allows you the opportunity to have different people who are who have different skill sets. So just to kind of summarize up those five tips that I found to be really great take-home points of virtual mentoring, utilize the cold email. You'd be surprised what you can get out of just an email saying, hey, I'm, I'm interested in chatting with you for just a few minutes, picking your brain, developing a mentorship there. Utilize your existing connections. They can a lot of times expand your horizons beyond what we typically know. You want to make sure you're utilizing you know, Google Hangouts, use face-to-face -face meetings, those are extremely valuable. And finally, have your virtual board of directors have more than one mentor. Understanding that they can be at different stages of their careers because it really helps to expand the breadth of advice you can have and there's no such thing as too much good advice. And with that, I'll pass along to Antonio. All right, so I have the honor of being the closer and the daunting task of following these really great speakers. So I know we've talked about a lot of the, the benefits of a com virtual community as a practice, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the pearls and pitfalls that we talked about, that we learned from being part of a virtual community of practice. So if you actually look at the literature, there have been most of the pitfalls when it comes to community of practice, both digital and non-digital communities of practice, the biggest pitfalls comes from lack of engagement. And there might be a few reasons why that happens, and I've not noted them up here. The first would be uh, the problem with the social hierarchy within the community of practice. And this often comes up in the business world where individuals may, of lower, of differing ranks may be, af be afraid to speak up and contribute to the group. The second may be the regional culture of the group, and this happens often in global communities of practice. And again, because of social hierarchies and social norms, individuals may not feel that they can speak up and be engaged in the community of practice that they are a part of. The third being the lack of a core group. I think Mike mentioned that having those mentors who, who get the people together and bring up the discussion and get the, get the individuals engaged and bring about distinct plans for each group, if there's not a, a core group like that, a, uh, the community of practice may fail. Obviously, limited in-person interaction, that's very obvious in a digital type of community of practice, but we started to demonstrate how we can get around that. And finally, time availability. That's very self-explanatory, and life happens, but a successful community of practice is an engaged community of practice. But fortunately, three of these five pitfalls that have been shown in the literature to happen why communities of practice fails, it was not really a problem with the faculty incubator. First of all, there was really no social hierarchy. We were all self-selected people who wanted to do, be part of this experience, and we were all engaged and motivated and, and chose to participate in this, this endeavor. Secondly, a regional, there was no problem of a regional culture. We all came from a very similar background. We were mostly all emergency medicine physicians. We all had a background and a desire to work in medical education. But that doesn't mean we have to all be the same. We've actually this year expanded to include more people who are not EM. And even one of our participants for the upcoming year is not even a clinician. She's a basic scientist and anatomist who is greatly involved in medical education with medical students. So diversity is a strength in a way in, part, in a community of practice. And the, obviously the lack of a core group was not a problem. We have very strong, dedicated, engaged mentors. And when the conversation on Slack lagged, they would put out prompt questions to get us remote motivated again and engaged and excited and start the conversation off by posing dangerous questions or posting the next journal article for us to read to keep us continually engaged. So how did we take care of the last two, two pitfalls that have been shown for communities of practice? First, the limited in-person in interaction there are a lot of platforms out there where we can get around that by using Google Hangouts. You don't have to be in the same location. And as Mike had mentioned, 
at any big meeting, we all got together. We had a wonderful launch day last year where we had an entire day of a workshop on design thinking where we really got to know each other and work around. And at, in Las Vegas, we got to hang out in Michelle Lynn's suite for, for cocktails and food. And <laughs> so, and just even just two days ago, we had a wonderful launch party for the next year where we really got to put a face to the names that, of the new, the new faculty bases. So you can get around the limited one-on-one -on -one interaction from a digital community of practice. And finally, time availability. Yes, life happens, but that's okay. Ways to get around that is set deadlines. Give, give the participants a long, a long period to work on something, but still set a firm deadline. That way you know that your monthly project is due at the end of the month. And some of the things that our mentors have learned from the experience last year to this year is that we've decreased the number of projects that we're going to have for the year, but have a longer period of time and also have scheduled months off where the engagement was lower, such as December when, around the holidays or in July when people are off with their families on vacation is going to be a break month. So giving people that opportunity to allow, let, allow life to happen. And as the last speaker, I get to have the honor of putting up the gratuitous family photo. <laughs> And this in the center is my daughter, and on your left is my son, and my daughter's best friend. And this is either the world's youngest community of practice or the nerdiest playgroup ever. All right, so thank you very much. And I'm just gonna do the Geraldo thing now and just walk around with the microphone. Next to um, we thought we'd open it up to the floor. I know that there are actually quite a few of uh, the faculty incubator participants in the audience. And they probably have some stuff they might wanna share as well. And I, Megan is also up here. And uh, she is here for A, support, B, because she looks great. And also number three is that uh, she's one of our mentors and we thought we'd like to have some mentor support up here for answering questions. So um, are there any questions about like the process or things that we learned or things that we kind of like had hiccups about? I, having done some of the one of the national courses, and I think this happens also just with regional meetings, is when you're there in the in the session, you get all these ideas, and you're like, oh, we're gonna go home. I'm gonna take this back to my shop, and then life happens, and things kind of trickle off. And I think what really appealed to me was the fact that it was year-round, and it had discrete deadlines, and that way that enthusiasm and excitement kept going throughout the year so you don't have that that waning of engagement and, and interest and so i think that helped and also having discrete deadlines throughout the year for different projects um i think that was also um very valuable and knowing that scholarship is can be something like a blog post or a primer was a big pull for this too that it doesn't always have to be the traditional type of things. So. Also, I'm not a traditional kind of guy. Um, <laughs> so 
Um, I think, um, you know, one of the appeals to me is, you know, you see a lot of the, the other, um, you know, ASAP teaching fellowship, whatever. Um, we'll use that as an example. Um, you don't always see um, um, tangible benefits from um, some of the uh, from folks that have went through it. Um, but, you know, fortunately, the chief resident incubator had been going on for a couple of years before, and it's had a proven track record. And I think the group of core mentors really speaks for itself. And, you know, why wouldn't I want to be um, part of that? So that's kind of, you know, why I wanted to jump in. I'll add that I think that, um, you know, rather than going to a, an institution for two weeks and sitting and listening to didactics and, and trying to absorb it all in two weeks and take it home, um, <clears throat> or doing something online in a very traditional manner, like this really was an innovative, kind of multimodal approach to this topic and incorporating, you know, all of these different social platforms um, and really trying to target, you know, kind of newer methodology and just even teaching us. Um, I thought was really appealing as well. And also for those of us, because I'm no longer junior faculty, but so I have, I come from a very different platform. And if I, to dedicate a week to go to Dallas or whatever for a course, my my family would kill me. And this was kind of nice that because it is virtual and digital, you could get the as long as you get the work done, no one cares when you when you do it. If I go and and slack after the kids go to bed, that's okay. And so this was a lot for people who don't have that flexibility to travel and you can be engaged from anywhere at any time, which is also another reason that this type of platform works as well. Um, in that case, so I thought it was kind of interesting throughout this process um, as you, as they kind of led to is it wasn't treated like a hierarchical system. Everyone's there to learn. Everyone worked together. So the rest of the happened at a few levels. People were bringing in problems and worked together as a group regardless kind of of their level. And you could, so from my standpoint, kind of serving as a mentor during that year, I learned a ton from the surrounding from the world. And people bring their own perspectives because we all have different training, we all have different experiences, and it's not just, you know, cut and dry, black and white. There's a lot of gray area, and there's a lot of different training you can get, and I think it's just interesting to really learn from the different incubators and everything they bring to the table from their own personal experience. So I definitely, you know, learned a lot from all of them. Sorry, sorry. I'm getting, I'm getting forced to talk, sorry. Um, no, I, I agree. I think that... Um, for the mentors themselves, as well as for the faculty babies, I think for the mentors themselves, you're also getting mentored because you're with a group of, of very dynamic educators um, that that within medical education have their own niche as well. And so I was with you know Sherbino, I always say your last name wrong, Sherbino, 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 um, for one of the months, and I and I feel like I was mentored in education theory, um, and so I think. Um, even the mentors were in the process of mentoring and then learning from the, the, the faculty baiters, the faculty baiters as well. Um, it's just, it's nice being in a, that dynamic community of practice within medical education because, um, because we're all passionate about the same thing. And so I think we can learn from each other. I agree with your point.
So I think one thing, I mean, just to comment on kind of the crankubator versus the vacubator is I think that um, the vacubator is almost like a mini masters. Um, and you really, you really get 12 concepts where, um, and you get a, a really short course on, on the communities of practice and education theory and um, program evaluation and, and all these different topics that are really important, you know, curriculum design that are really important in medical education. And, and so I think that that's a, that's a plus. That's not, that's not something that we necessarily, I think, learned. I think that that's something that has, was very successful. Um, it being structured that way so that you can cover those core top, um, um, topics and get kind of this mini boot camp for faculty members. So I'll put a quick caveat that the community practice was actually Andy's. Okay. But um, for, with regards to a learning standpoint, um, a few things I think we learned. Um, one thing was it was really just nice to have that small group of 30 people. It keeps it a lot more intimate. There's a lot more accountability. And it just kind of makes it a lot more comfortable for people to open up. From what I can tell and from my own experiences, when you have 30 people that you're much closer to than when you have a larger group. And so it worked very nicely in that regard. Um, the other thing I think we learned was figuring out how to lay out pro projects and how to work within timelines. And that was, again, a nice thing about having everyone kind of on the same page trying to do the best for our incubators, for the best for the people in the program is that every year we're trying to just improve a little bit more and adjust things a little bit more. And so we modified it. We took every piece of feedback and we looked at it and we said, okay, how can we make it better? Whether it be timing of projects, whether it be saying, you know what? Maybe during December when everyone's out of town trying to do these things, we focus on having wellness and not have a bunch of projects during that time. So we learn things throughout the year and really benefit from just, you know, very open feedback. And, you know, everyone seemed to really love the program. We just tried to make it better every year. participants, but that also allows for now a, a, an even bigger layering of people that are near peers, that are designated near peers, that can stand up and ask those awkward in-between questions and stuff like that. So I think that that's going to add something to it too. But I think that that's something that if you're trying to set up a community practice in your home shop, you, know, you might want to try something like this across disciplines or maybe within the residence program. Just making sure you have some junior faculty and it's not just the program director and like all the R first years, you know, like awkward. Um, you probably need to have some of your peer mentors and different people at different levels. And then you need to have some champions as well that are willing to kind of be there and be positive and, uh, and positive. There's a lot of DMing that goes on and there's like sometimes there's an art to like running a discussion where if someone's like, I can't find that paper, you might like DM one person that's a little bit more quiet and be like, here's the answer to her question. You want to post it? <laughs> uh, and, and, then, and then people can engage in a conversation, right? Or you can sidebar and and if people are having trouble, and then you're like, okay, now we've fixed your problem. Do you want to kind of like give people the hint that maybe there's something else that you could do to fix the problem? And I think the last thing is that the struggle is real when it comes to integrating work with work with work. 
right? There's work-life balance, but adding this on top of all the other jobs that you guys already have, your clinical job, your administrative job, your academic job, and then you've got, you've got like, you know, your life as well outside of that. Now we're adding on homework. Well, it, it, it gets to a point where sometimes you just have to say, hey, I can't handle anymore and meet your saturation point. And sometimes that struggle is actually really important to know when that lever needs to be pulled. And I think that we're gonna need to work on debriefing that a little bit more when it happens. Because I think that we need to support our colleagues to identify maybe three steps before they're about to burn out and just check out, but rather, oh, okay, it looks like you need an extension, that's okay, like take your time, don't worry about it. It's not like there's a grade or anything like that, so I think that we gotta figure out some ways to like help soften uh, the experience, but help you integrate work with work, because I think that that's one of the hardest parts of being a junior faculty member or mid-career faculty member. I think um, you're like not going to get me to, to shut up now. Um, so I think that that also you, there needs to be what it, it needs to be beneficial, right? So so there needs to be a reason that you're spending this time working in this community practice, and so that may be different for a variety of reasons. So that might be that you want to get involved in this community. That may be that you want to learn something about medical education. But I think that the benefit too is to have a really strong leader like Mike who's keeping everyone on task and then to have really um, engaged, brilliant people like Mike and, and Teresa and Lainey that, um, and Michelle Lynn that are running it um, to because they're so innovative in how we can make this scholarship. So like, Andy showed you all these papers that we published and um, book chapters that we published. And so the time that we spent on Slack and in this community practice, we got out of it scholarship. And so in that way, you're making your time work for you doubly because you're getting scholarship with this virtual network of people. And so you're using this network in order to make scholarship happen more efficiently. So I think that that's a huge benefit of it. Any other questions? <laughs> That's unfair. Thank you. Uh, John, great. John, that was great.